Welcome to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The key to getting the most out of the seminar series is to listen to the small things, the subtle adjustments our faculty teams adhere to when the fishing might be tough or they're trying to target trophy game fish. That's what we call the gold nuggets of the seminar series. So come with me, let's get right to it and join, in progress, the Saltwater Sports and the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. A very interesting session, whether you're from the Northeast, the Gulf, Florida, and even the Bahamas, yellowfin tuna. We have Ryan DeGraw out of Jersey, who is an ardent offshore angler, the living legend himself, as I like to call him, over 50 years of charter experience out of the Miami area, Captain Bouncer Smith, who has a strong handle on yellow fins in the Bahamas. And he runs a charter boat behind Worldwide Sportsman in Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys, but he spent a lot of time out in Venice, Louisiana, chasing the big yellow fins there. That's Captain Ryan Wenzel. So now, let's, we're gonna sort of break this up, and this is gonna be geared mainly to some of the subtleties involved in chunking and lie baiting for yellow fins. There are numerous ways of fishing for them, but first, like anything else, we have to try to factor in to where you try to locate this fish the right conditions. And I'm gonna start off here being out of South Florida and the runs that we make to the Bahamas up in uh, Northwest Providence Channel. Two things that really come into play there is number one, you wanna to try to find the deep structure like the canyons. This is where a quality fish finder comes in that has the punch to reach down to really good depths. And you can zoom in, analyze it more, but for the most part, you keep it from zero down to the bottom to see if there's any fish that you may mark within the water column that's very, very crucial. Is locating any kind of a surface temperature break or an edge. And you have the Roffers fishing forecast analysis to consult, but you also have from Sirius XM, their fish mapping, they have the sea surface temperature contours and they also have the sea surface temperature fronts, which tell you where the major temperature breaks are, where there could be converging currents. And they also have the plankton fronts and the plankton contours, which shows you the amount of nutrients in the area, which could bring in flyers and then in turn bring in these big elephants. So it's location, it's also water quality. And what have you found with the elephants up in the channel as far as the prime time to catch these? Uh, well, here it is, we're in the middle of February and they're already catching fish up there now. Seems like every year, guys try earlier and they find the fish earlier. So it's a changing fishery as people experiment. But the bottom line is it's typically been late April through July as being the prime. But uh, I know you left out the most important piece of electronics because looking for yellowfin tunas in the Bahamas is all about bird Absolutely. radar. Absolutely, exactly right. And dialing it in to see the birds working in the area they come late, late afternoon, generally speaking. And have you seen these birds where they are up in the middle of the day and you could catch elephants in the little day in the Bahamas or mainly regulated super early, super late? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that when I had my greatest elephant trip uh, south of Lucaya or, or way northeast of Bimini, uh, we, were, we, we had limited out all the yellowtails we wanted, and we headed offshore at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we found the birds, and we found the yellow fins, And it was so good that we were sitting around eating ice-cold watermelon, and the, my mate was sitting on the covering board, hand-feeding the yellow fins 10 feet off the back of the boat. The watermelons, all right, or pilchards. No, we were feeding pilchards to the <laughs> okay, yellow well, I was, was going to see and, if I could trip you up, that's all. Well, well we just want to see uh, if you were paying attention. But <laughs> it was the most unbelievable tuna fishing I've ever seen. Ryan, let's speed back up northeast Jersey area. Uh, you look at the Sirius XM fish map, and they have a sea surface height, what they call anomaly. And I'm actually proud of myself. I was able to pronounce that word correctly the first time. That, I, I'm stumbling after some reason. And when you look at that, there's these different, it could be pretty much eddies or whatever. You've got a circulation feature. And as it comes off, there's another circulation feature between the two where they sort of converge. The conversion points is where these upwellings and nutrients tend to be, which is very good for tuna fishing. Now, out of Jersey way out there for yellowfins, what are you looking for condition-wise for your yellowfins? So, 
condition wise, I definitely notice that the fish do tend to eat better when it is a little nastier out, uh, whether that be because there's less boat traffic or just because they like to eat when it when it gets a little churned up. The chunking, chunking bite especially is definitely always better, um, noticeably better than, you know, like a slick, calm day. And let me shift over to you, you know, uh, Ryan. In the Gulf of Mexico, looking for the tunas, you spent a lot of time uh, working on boats and, and running boats out of Venice, Louisiana. What are you doing differently, if anything, that's gonna get you on the tunas there? Is it a structure game? Is it a water edge game and temperature wise or what? So uh, the most time I spent up there was in the summers. And uh, during that time of the year in Venice, we we're going out to the oil rigs and you know, daily the rigs change. You just kind of stay up to date on where the fish are. But we're looking for the right rig that's holding the fish. And we like to go up current of the rig you know, a couple hundred yards, because the closer you get to the rig, the more kudas and stuff you get. But the further away you are, you mark the tunas, you can either set up with a live bait like a pogey, which is a menhaden, or, you know, start chunking. But that's the way we're getting most of our yellowfins that time of year. Still you know? on the rigs, pretty much on exactly. that too. Exactly, rigs, okay. and then fall time, you know, it shifts to the shrimp boat bite, exactly. where you're behind the shrimp boats. Okay, and on that, we're gonna take a commercial break, and when we come back, I wanna get specific on some of the subtleties involved in chunking them and live baiting from leaders to hooks, to baits, to position them, et cetera. We're coming right back with the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Discussion is yellowfin tuna. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. And let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers, and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Very intriguing discussion going on regarding yellowfin tuna. We talked about signs that lead us to tuna out of the Bahamas, uh, Gulf of Mexico, up in the Northeast. Now, chunking could be a very basic thing. All right, you chunk and you free line baits back out. But what separates the three of you in particular from a lot of the other anglers is the subtleties, which you've learned over your decades of fishing experience and making things happen that way. So Ryan, I'm going to talk to you first because you're, you're a Jersey guy. And I always said that when it comes to yellowfin tuna fishing, and I might get in trouble with other states and all and anglers, but you, you guys in Jersey got it going on. You've got it dialed yeah. in. Tell me some of the subtleties involved, either hook size, what are you doing with leader, and what are you doing differently that, that sort of separates you from some of the other boats out there? So definitely changing up your leader is one of the biggest things that I would say for us makes a big difference. We generally, when we start chunking, we have leaders tied up anywhere from 30 all the way up to 80. Now, is this fluorocarbon? Yes, all okay. fluorocarbon because of abrasion resistance. Yes. It's definitely, you'll have days where it won't make a difference what pound leader you're using. You'll have days where they'll only bite 30. You'll have days well where sometimes we even mm -hmm. have to go down to 25. Mm -hmm. And catching a 60, 70 pound tuna on 25 pound leader is not fun by <laughs> any means. <laughs> But it does take a lot of patience, but if you do go down, it will get you more So bites. when you're scaling down like 25 pound test leader, what are you doing with the hook size? Are you scaling down the hook size as well? We or? are fishing very, very small hooks for these fish. You wanna fish the smallest, heaviest gauge wire hook that you can find. Um, it helps if you're fishing with your hook and your bait like this, you're not doing it the right way. Your, your hook needs to be completely Buried in inside of your bait, yep. You can't have any of the hook exposed. You can't have any of your knot coming out exposed. Everything needs to be tucked away into the bait. When you said you scale down to 25 pound test, and one of the ways you cheat the system is with that circle hook. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is the circle hook, if it's set correctly, the eye is on the outside of the fish's mouth. Yep. The teeth can't saw across the leader. So you cheat the system with the use of a circle hook and you can get by and get more bites. And I think it's more prominent in our clear water here mm -hmm. than is in Jersey. And I'm gonna circle back to uh, Ryan Wenzel in a second, but bouncers get very impatient. You wanna make a point here. <laughs> no, I wanna <laughs> make a point on just how difficult it can be to trick a big elephant tuna. Yes. I had Harry Vernon's father out fishing a long time ago, and we had filled the live well with herring, and we'd been fishing all day, and, and it was late in the afternoon, and I was chumming with live herring, and we were fishing with live herring on 50 pound leaders, 
And this 150, 175 pound yellowfin tuna starts coming out from underneath the boat, eating every herring I throw in the water. Throw our hook bait and three freebies all in the water at one time. One, two, three. Swims right by. George, that afternoon on that one fish, it probably ate 30 baits. 12 pound test. So, the bottom line, did you catch it or you did not catch it? Well, no, we didn't even get well, a bite. I thought, Well, I thought this was going to story because I know Harry Vernon's dad. I'm surprised you didn't tell me he ended up shooting a tuna. <laughs> well, he didn't have a harpoon or a gun with him. <laughs> All right, okay. Let me shift gears here. Uh, Ryan, I mean, Venice, Louisiana, when the tuna are there, what do you do when things get a little bit tougher? You got a lot of boats. Usually it's the first boat or two to that rig that catches them. It is. People coming late to the party, what can they do to try to encourage a bite when the other people have beaten it up pretty good? So one thing we always started off with was live baiting, because you catch your bait towards the river and it's more brackish water, but by the time you get out, your bait's gonna die because it, the salinity will kill it. So you always start with the live bait, but usually, you know, after that good bite passes, you get the next good bite when people switch to chunking. So we would always try to be the first boat to switch to chunking before the other boats would. And we're chunking things like blackfin that we would cherish know, in the Keys. I know. So you don't want to, you like going and spearfishing the Keys, which you and I always exactly. have that little yeah. difference there. So you sure. always do things a little bit to, to raise the hackles yeah. on that. But go ahead, continue. Exactly, so we'd be using black. you know, blackfin or even rainbow runner, which are another great eating fish. But we were chunking those, and uh, like the other Ryan mentioned, stuffing the hook in the bait by just cutting a small little slit in it. Yep. But you know, another important thing with the circle hook is snelling it when you're going tuna fishing. Now, now why? Because I hear people, they say they like to snell. Others say they like to go right to the eye. What, what, why? So uh, my captain, the first one I worked for, always taught me that you know, when you snell the hook, it's going to pull it out and around, and it's going to set it a lot easier, and definitely keep the line even further away from the mouth of the fish. So you have a higher chance of hooking the fish that bites it and keeping it on without okay, the Okay, and abrasion. to play devil's advocate. Yeah. And I had learned, and I was from the school, that you always put a loop knot, a small one, on the circle hook because if you're live baiting, it gives the live bait more latitude to do its thing. You're not restricting it as much as you would with a snell. So two different schools of thought here. Yeah, they're I really... Can, oh, go ahead. I can add to that one. Yes. With the loop, the circle hook can turn better to turn into the corner. And I've proven that on the side of a five-gallon bucket, that the circle hook turned better with the loop. So you're saying if you snell, it's not as likely to turn back in the point go in itself. No, turn back into the fish's jaw. Oh, with, 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 the, with the loop? Yeah. Okay, so, you, so you're, you're a proponent of the loop on yes, this. Yes, very sir. much so. Well, you and I are both from South Florida are probably, yeah. you may have showed me that trick, bouncer. <laughs> anyway, on that note, we're taking a commercial break. We're gonna come right back into this. Uh, you're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We'll be right back. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix. Always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We're filming at the International Games Association, and I've got a yellowfin tuna panel in progress. And Ryan, let me circle back to you again. When you talk about shifting over to the chunking mode, is a rhyme or reason how you're doing that? What is the broadcasting rate of the chunks that you're putting out? Do you freeline a chunk? Do you weight one down? Give me something to go on here. Yeah, so we're, we're freelining all of them, and we'll set up three or four rods all on one side of the boat and side drift and just slowly out of the speed of the current, letting your chunks out. And we're maybe throwing, you know, one chunk every, you know, half a minute, every minute, you know, not a lot, because you don't want to fill the fish up and then, you know, shut the bite down. So very subtle chunking. And uh, like I said, first boat to start chunking usually gets bit. So we'd often go below the gunnel and start cutting our chunks bait under the gunnel so nobody would see us getting ready to switch <laughs> the chunking. So basically, how you're counting the live bait is you're shifting gears and doing something totally different. Exactly. Which segues me, or segues in me to talk to you two about this. When you're chunking out there, uh, or even live baiting for the tunas, is you had mentioned something about also dropping down in the water column and, and jigging, is that correct? Yes. Fill me in on that. So jigging and popping while we're chunking is, is going to be how we get most of our fish, believe it or not, especially in Jersey this summer. The inshore yellowfin bite did get a little 
out of hand as opposed to how many people knew about it and where to go for it. Um, so chunking and, or popping and jigging while we were chunking definitely helped us put a couple more fish in the boat over everyone else who was just, you know, still had their standard dead baits or their live baits out. And Bouncer, you're one that uh, plays the game in the Bahamas where that's normally, you'll sit there, if you had the pilchard, you'll live chum these tuna up and try to get them up the surface and get them on live baits, but you're also throwing the irons down as well. Well, it's very critical to, to, to vertical jig while you're yellow and tuna fishing because your chunks are going out away from the boat and they're sinking very slow, especially if it's windy. Whereas when you drop vertical jigs, this, this vertical jig is meant to work very fast. It goes down very fast, but you may have a main body of fish a couple hundred feet below the surface. And this can get down there, rip back up through them, go back down again, rip up through them. And this is more of a flutter jig type. And this, you'll get to the level of the fish and you'll just do a lot of lazy jigging in it, flutters. It's like a dying minnow down there. And both are very, very effective. What pound test lead are you running those? Uh, generally speaking, we use 50 pound fluorocarbon and, and we use a, on our jigging rods, we use a 50 or 60 pound braid. Okay, very cool. And, and, and when we run those Bahamas and we're doing that and we have our lie baits, and in, in the cases where we don't have enough, like pilchards of chum, we'll go with goggle eyes or, or runners and we'll look for the birds and we'll get set up and we'll put some baits out at the surface. We'll put at least one or two down deep, uh, typical tw uh, 30 pound test outfits, short bimini twist. We used a Bristol knot to go 40 feet of a fluorocarbon leader, 30 pound or 40 pound, a little barrel swivel, and then a real length of leader that might be maybe 40 pound test to pound out or hit in an inline circle hook. And we'll have a little weight that we will attach to the split in your bimini twist, one of the legs, hang it on, 10 ounces or 16 ounces, we'll lower that down to 300 feet. So as we're drifting live baits, we've got at least one down in the water calm, and a lot of times that thing gets nailed, and when you fight the fish, as that sinker comes up, it, it's on a swivel, you lift it off the double line, the angler could wind in the next 40 feet right to the gap. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. Stay cool and protected while fishing. Calcutta Outdoors, hard working outdoor gear. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West. Visit flakeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the final installment of the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. George, I gotta tell you one thing that really blew my mind when it comes to chunking for yellowfin tunas. I've been lucky enough to go to the Cayman Islands and fish quite a bit, and this will really crack up all the guys that try to tuna fish in the Bahamas, but we're chunking, and one of the, the natives, they use hand lines. And one of the guys caught a 100-pound uh, silky shark. And he pulls it up to the boat, and they're all excited. And, and we're going, what's the big deal of the shark? They, they gaffed it. They drug it in the boat. They beat it over the club. They flayed off a chunk of it. And then they cut the chunk up into pieces about half the size of your hand. And they beat it with the back of a cleaver and they started baiting all their hooks with chunks of shark. And we had more yellowfin tuna bites on chunks of shark than anything else. Well, Bouncer, it thank you. It cured the whole you, Bahamas problem. You just solved our problem here in South Florida with sharks. I was about to ask you, that wasn't Harry Vernon who did that, was he? <laughs> no, that, right. was, uh, that was with the guys in the Cayman Islands. Uh, Ryan, give me maybe one or two subtleties involved in either live bait your tunas or, or chunking with them. It, it's always routine to make sure that chunk flows back at the same rate, but what else can you give me? Here? So I would definitely say, like Ryan touched on earlier, not overfeeding the fish is one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make, especially when you get a lot of fish close to the boat, fired up, everyone gets excited, everyone wants to just keep throwing heaves and heaves and heaves of chunks over to keep the fish there, which works for 15 or 20 minutes, but then the fish get full, and they go back. If you keep two or three chunks every time you throw chunks, just two or three chunks, two or three chunks, it doesn't matter if there's no fish behind the boat or if there's 100 fish behind the boat. If you keep throwing chunks, it doesn't matter if it's two or if it's 20, the fish are gonna stay there. No doubt. And I wanna talk very briefly, we've got about a minute left here with the fluorocarbon leader. It has a refractive index that's nearly identical to water. It makes it difficult for the fish to see tiny hooks 
making it subtle whether you're live baiting or so, but some of the tricks with fluorocarbon, it has a memory. When you pull it off that spool, it, it, it's big circles on it. Pull it under pressure, just enough you can stretch it for about 30, 40 seconds, it'll lay out like a stick of spaghetti uncooked. Then some of the real pros on these tunas, when they bring it in, they'll have an alcohol wipe and they'll wipe that down just to maintain that clarity. So there's a couple of tricks with the fluorocarbon. And the last 30 seconds, I'm gonna say, when you go for yellow fins, the boat side deal is crucial. Good friend of mine, Harry Vernon III, you gotta have somebody who's really good in the gaff. And I thought maybe, you know, we, we, we'd share, you know, bring a couple extra gas is what I'm trying to tell you when you go out for yellowfin yeah. tuna. Yeah, it's true. George, bring your kite. Bring some dead flying fish. If you're gonna be drifting out there or if you're trolling for that matter, Put a kite up, let a flying fish with the wings open lay on top of the water. It's going to get the fish. Awesome. But anyway, I appreciate that session and tips on catching yellowfin tuna. That's Ryan Winzel, Ryan DeGraw out of Jersey, and the living legend himself, Captain Bouncer Smith. <laughs> well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Now, adhering to Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series tradition, you still have chances to win door price drawings. Simply go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door prize page, just give us your name, phone number, and an email address, and at the conclusion of the airing of the series in December, we will draw for a number of excellent door prizes. Get right to it. We'll see you on the next episode of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series.